Yeah, so uh, I'm really sorry. I need, I need to apologize to start with because uh, uh, it's called kernel recipes and I'm not a kernel hacker. Uh, so I will try to talk to you about relationship between the Linux community uh, and guys we have inside HP, what we do, uh, how the interaction is going on, and uh, hopefully it will be interesting uh, despite not talking about locks or uh, network packets or uh, building a kernel. Um, Okay. Um, so I'm based in Grenoble in France. I'm working in a solution center where we are hosting customers. We do proof of concept. We do uh, workshops with customers. We have our own data center uh, that you can see on the, on the left hand side here. Um, tons of equipment, our own internet access. So we can have relationship with customers, with partners and build stuff. So in order to test, and among that, we do a lot of uh, open source related activities. Um, of course, uh, the operating system of choice is Linux on, on that. So myself, I'm Bono Konek. I'm based in, in that solution center. I've been working for HP for the last 15 years. I have nothing to do with laptops. So keep your questions for my colleagues working on laptops. I'm working on servers all the time. And as we will split the company in two parts, uh, starting the 1st of November, I will definitely have nothing to do with laptop anymore. <laughs> no printers, by the way. So just sitting <laughs> with, uh, with servers, that would be sufficient for, for me. So I'm involved in uh, some open source projects. I've used Linux for uh, P, uh, 0.99 PL14. Uh, but just I use, as a user, I, I look at some part of the code. I had involvement with some patches but that other people more clever than I can do but I, I cannot do uh, kernel development. So I'm working on a disaster recovery solution project, uh, packaging pro software. Uh, I'm a contributor to, to Magia, which is the best distribution uh, available, as you have seen since the start of this uh, event, and involved in various activities for the community and for HP. Um, so who does not know HP in the room? Okay, so you know we are involved in a lot of uh, technological aspects. Uh, a lot of involvement. Linux started uh, around the, around the, 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 the year 1998. So it's typically when most of the large IT manufacturers realized that uh, they had to support something else than just those Windows, uh, OS2, uh, Solaris, uh, Xenix, and all those type of very strange operating systems. Uh, even if we were knowing way before that it was already an interesting stuff to do. Uh, so, so HP started to, to develop support, official support of Linux on our server. So again, I'm talking about servers here. Uh, and we developed different tracks around uh, open source ad adoption throughout the year. So this is more uh, to, to give you an idea of where we are playing and why we need to interact with, with you as a community. Uh, in order to support um, the ecosystem, we need to be involved in a certain number of open source and open data, open specifications uh, across the globe on different topics. So we are a sponsor of the Linux Foundation as well as of the OpenStack Foundation. We are involved with the uh, Open NFV uh, initiative. So OP NFV from the, again, from the Linux Foundation or uh, Open Network Foundation here. Uh, certain number of uh, activities around the HC, the UEFI forum, um, you name it, you have it. Um, Interesting, okay. Ah, even more interesting. Is there a Linux guru able to debug my laptop here? In the room? <laughs> this one is really interesting. So you will see everything I do on my laptop. Uh, did I lost my did I lost my slides? Hmm. So I should have some more. Sorry for that.
Okay, it's not Linux. It's LibOffice which crashed. Seems. Okay. Uh, so where do we use? Wh why do we do that? Why, why are we involved as a community? Because we, our our customers are uh, moving faster and faster. They are asking us more and more performance, more and more speed of adaptation, more and more different solutions that they want to deploy on their side. Uh, all those type of stuff. And to, so this is a marketing slide, but uh, it has some some meanings for us as a, as techies. Is that we need to look at all those uh, trends that are appearing uh, in the IT ecosystem. And in front of all of these trends, you will see an open source based solution that you can adapt to fit your needs and to give to your customers as, as a very good solution to solve their speed, agility, mobility problems, etc. Um, so again, what do we do that? It's because as a manufacturer and as a company, we first are a big user of open source and Linux internally. We have tons of systems running it. We have a certain number of partners that we use who are Linux distribution vendors, the Red Hat, the SUSE, the uh, Canonical, uh, and all the what we call community distributions, uh, we, which have no company behind to help them support their environment. Uh, we need to deal with those because our customers are asking us to provide them hardware that they can use to run those software on top of it. Uh, we use open source software, we use Linux inside embedded systems um, for management purposes, control. We do a lot of uh, involvement of people inside projects. We support, for example, uh, Debian conferences, the Debian project. We used to have two Debian project leader, a uh, member of, uh, of HP, Bidel Garbi, Martin Michael Meyer. Uh, we participate to a certain number of events, so this one, for example, but we sponsor and, and support a certain number of, uh, of structure of the uh, open source ecosystem that helps people meet together, discuss about the technology, and allow them to improve the technology. And all of that is also to, to allow us to, to help our customers with the solutions they are choosing. Okay, so concretely, um, we have sold a large number of Linux systems throughout the years. So I said it started in 1998. Uh, we have the, the numbers back to, to 2003 for the selling servers. So we have sold a certain number of servers running Linux. Uh, to give you an idea, 25% of all the servers going outside of our plants are, are, are aimed at running Linux as an operating system. That's old numbers. I'm pretty sure it's much more than that because not everybody knows what our customers are running on our systems. So that's, so that's what we know for sure because it's linked to the fact that we are selling some software licenses to the customer as well. So when we resell Red Hat Enterprise Linux or SLES to our customers, we know that they are running Linux. But there are a lot of customers buying servers and who don't tell us what they will run on it as an operating system. It could be FreeBSD, it could be Linux, it could be whatever they want. So it's at least that number. It's probably more than that, and especially with the new uh, big data cloud approaches where customers are buying tons of servers and run a lot of Linux on top of it, it's probably much more. Um, today, the, so for a very long time, we have had servers which were, which were multi-purpose. So you were buying an x86 box and you were running everything on it. Everything meaning uh, HPC performance clusters, meaning mail server, meaning web servers, meaning I don't know, you name it, additional cards, doing specific uh, treatment, uh, telco, uh, financial services, etc., etc. So that's still, uh, I would say, the, the main range of hardware that we have, and that hardware needs to run Linux pretty well, to, in a pretty large way, because we don't know what the customer will run as a workload on top of those systems. So it needs to run efficiently for most use cases. Um, but that's not sufficient today. We have customers who are asking us to provide systems, such as the one on the right-hand side here, uh, which, are, which provides more availability, which have redundancy inside the box. So you have multiple ways to deal with redundancy today. Uh, you can say, okay, I build a cloud, I do scale-out, I multiply the number of nodes, 
and my application is aware of the environment and takes care of issues. If I lose one VM, if I lose one server, I don't care because I spread the load, I have the HA proxy software, I do all, all, the, all the balancing I want and everything is working fine despite me losing some uh, compute resources. But you have some other customers who want to have availability in the box because they don't want to lose a box. The box is important, they want to keep it alive. So we have that type of systems uh, which can host a large amount of memory, a large number of CPUs. You have other type of uh, customers who say, okay, we don't care about the availability of the box. We want, for example, to buy very cheap boxes with pretty no intelligence inside the box. And we want to have tons of them. And if we lose one, that's not a problem. If we lose a rack, then we replace the rack. So it's a completely different approach. And the application needs to, to be designed to understand the context, the hardware context in which it works, to be able to recover from errors. And you have some specific systems also targeting specific type of markets. Uh, for example, a server like that has a lot of disks inside. And you can do very well uh, Ceph implementation of Swift implementation or other software on top of it to do object storage, for example, on, on top of the box. So it should be very well suited for IOs, uh, networking IOs and, and, and uh, uh, hard disk IOs as well. You have a, a flash systems, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So a, a lot of those are, are, are nowadays not generic anymore, but really suited for specific workloads. And it will the, the IT is evolving into more and more specialized systems in the future. But all of those mostly will run Linux. Um, so what do we do with uh, with distributions? Our customers. So I said I'm not a kernel hacker because we are not really involved inside HP in, in developing around the kernel, except for some, some specific parts I will detail just after, but most of the cells we are doing are done by providing an enterprise Linux distribution to our customers. That's what they ask us to provide to them. So they ask for certification of those distributions on top of our platform. And we have QA teams, we have dev teams, we ensure that we can provide additional components on top of uh, the, the, the operating system to do hardware management. And I'm sorry to say that those pieces are not open source, despite we try to do it, but the, the, the business unit is considering that there is some intellectual property at the hardware level they don't want to disclose outside, which is uh, often a, a reason for, for those people to not open source the software. Um, and so we provide tools which are free of charge, but not open source, to our users so that they can deal, for example, with the smart array controller, so the red controller we have, with the onboard uh, management cards that we have, uh, with the BIOS from the operating system. So all of those components that I will detail a bit later on uh, are part of what we deliver on top of those uh, distribution, and we support the distribution. So we act as a single point of contact for the customer. Uh, for customers who were uh, Unix customers for a very long time, they were used to call when they had a problem. Now they can call us when they have a problem with the Linux environment. We do support at the hardware level and at the software level, uh, which is a single point of contact for customers. But what we do is more into, a bit, bit more interesting than that. Uh, all the drivers that we need to run one of our server with a Linux operating system are pushed upstream. So our RAID controller, our uh, management card, all the NIC, all the HBAs that we can put in a machine, we ensure that there is an open source driver available and upstream. Which means that we can also support from a hardware perspective all the um, what we call community distributions. So distributions which are managed by a community of people and not by a company behind. As every kernel upstream has what it's needed to run our systems, you can use Debian, you can use CentOS, you can use OpenSUSE, Mageia, or whatever. You will be able to run that software on our hardware, and you will be supported by HP if you have a hardware issue with that software. Despite the software not being supported by us, because we don't have the possibility to do that, it's done by the community. And we provide a certain number of additional uh, components on, on top of that. Okay, uh, one page, if you're interested by Linux on, on, on our servers, you go here and you have everything in terms of, uh, for, for each machine, you have information about, for all those distribution, enterprise distribution, you have 
the support uh, available and you have the minimum versions that you need to run of that distribution because um, you may well understand that when you issue a new server, uh, a Red Hat distribution, which is already five years old, may not have the right driver to run correctly on our server. So we, need, we, we require a minimum version of that distribution vendor. So it could be slash 11 SP 3 or 4. It could be uh, RHEL 7.2. Uh, there is a minimum set of drivers that needs to be inside the kernel so that our hardware is working correctly. But you can also understand that sometimes there is a mismatch between uh, the hardware platform we provide and the software which is available, which may miss some drivers because we have more recent hardware and the drivers are not yet in the distribution. So in those cases, we also provide some drivers on our website. You can download them from here because you may need for a small amount of time to have access to those drivers to make the installation work correctly. So if you are in, uh, I don't know, RHEL 6.5 and you don't have the right driver for our new server, uh, you download that driver, you add it to your environment, and it will work up to the time where it goes into 6.6 and is adopted by, by Red Hat as a standard driver. Uh, the position of HP with regard to drivers in the kernel is that you should use, as much as you can, distribution drivers, which means most of the time upstream drivers. You should only use our drivers when your system is not supported out of the box. So we release them, but we don't recommend that you use them all the time. Just use what your distribution vendor is providing because from the support perspective, it makes everybody's life easier. Ours and yours as a customer and also the distribution vendor. Okay, so what are, what are, what are the specificities in our systems that needs interaction with the Linux community? Uh, so we have one component inside our server called the ILO, which is uh, uh, a sort of a server inside a server. So for those who don't know, uh, you have a, an Ethernet port on the system, you have that chip on the machine, and you have the possibility through that remote port to have access to the system, get information on the system, have access to the physical console of the system remotely, and do a lot of operations such as uh, mounting remote devices. So you have an ISO image on your PC, and you want to boot your server from that ISO image, that component will help you make that ISO image seen by your server and able to boot from that ISO image through the network transparently as if it, were, it was local. Um, so that component requires a driver. So if you want to use it from the operating system, because it's separated normally from your, from your system, so it can be used completely out of band, but if you want to use it in band, you can also do that. There is an HP ILO driver that you can load in, in Linux, and which is loaded by default by, by most distributions anyway, and which will allow you some additional features from the operating system. So for example, you will be able to flash your firmware from the operating system going through that component. That's the type of feature which is added, and that driver is open source and part of the standard uh, Linux kernel. So we provide, as I said, a certain number of additional features to deal with the hardware from the operating system, from Linux. So I will detail those, uh, those different, uh, uh, some of those different commands later on. For example, you have a small UID on, on the front of your server, a blue LED that you can uh, press if you are in a data center with hundreds of servers and your operator needs to replace a disk, he wants to know on which server to, uh, to act. Uh, or if he needs to open the box to replace a card or whatever, uh, so you can turn the blue light remotely and say to your operator, this is a server which has a blue light blinking that you need to uh, open and change the component which is uh, uh, inside it. So typically that's a small binary which, uh, which you can uh, call to, to make that type of operation. So type of interaction with the hardware that you have. Um, let me skip this one. So what is the, the stack we are proposing in terms of uh, software components? So, at the driver level, everything is open source, everything is available in the standard Linux kernel, and every distribution inherits from it. So here you have the different hardware components of the server. Uh, so our RED controller, which has a driver called HPSA nowadays, and a command line interface tool to configure the hardware RED of your system, and also a UI, which is a web-based, which is also available. Similarly for the ILO components, remote access, you have the driver, you have one command which allows you to configure that component from your operating system. 
Um, and, and you have the different type of cards that you can put in the server with different tools ad additional on top of it. Um, what is interesting in, in the orientation taken by the, by the business unit around developing servers, what we are doing here on Redfish, and I will detail it a bit more um, in a couple of slides, this is the idea is to add, as part of our ILO, a component on the chip, a RESTful API, which allows you remotely through a REST interface to have inventory information on your machine and pass actions on your systems in a standard way. That, that part is standardized between different manufacturers and will allow people developing interfaces to monitoring inventory of hardware to do that in a much more smooth fashion in the future when uh, most of the firmware <coughs> will, will have been updated with that version. I will detail that a bit later on. So some of the commands, what you can do from Linux using those commands. Um, so this one is, is interacting with the BIOS parameter. So, so today we are providing those commands. That, that exists for at least five or six years minimum. Um, and the REST API that I mentioned just before is a new version of all those components, which will allow you to do that in a more standard fashion. For now, each command has its own set of parameters and, and way of interacting with the, with the hardware. So you have the automatic server restart feature. If your server is, uh, is not answering for a certain number of minutes, uh, it will reboot automatically, and you have a driver in your kernel, which is uh, a counter going down to, to zero, and each time it's running, it's putting back uh, the, the counter to a, to a higher value, and when the system is not answering anymore, the counter is going down to zero, and when the counter is at zero, the server reboots automatically. That's the type of feature from a, at hardware level that you can uh, pilot from, from your operating system. A boot order, hyper-threading, uh, boot prompt, etc., etc. For the red controller, you have the uh, SSA CLI command, which allows you to get information on your uh, contro red controllers inside the system and have access to all uh, the information, but also to create your red um, volumes directly from your operating system. So you can script that, you can put that in a pre install phase of your a Kickstart, uh, Auto Yast, or whatever tool you're using to deploy automatically your servers. Um, Again, that's the only way, so from, from a Linux perspective, you don't have access to the low-level hardware once you have a red controller in between. You don't know what disks you have. You just see one volume presented by your operating system to you, and you can use your partitioning tool to, to partition your disk, etc. But you don't see which is the disk I have, which firmware version is on the disk, which part number of the disk do I have to <coughs> check co coherency, etc. So, the only way to have access to that is to use that type of tool which interacts with, uh, with the hardware at low level to give you information, for example, cache ratio if you want to change that. So all, all the parameters here, here which make sense can be changed uh, from the command line. Similarly with the ILO component, you have the possibility, so this one is an HTML, is an XML based uh, format, but you have the possibility again to change the way your uh, an onboard system is working and you can pass, uh, so you can write a configuration file from uh, the current configuration, you can modify it and reset the configuration of your ILO component from that configuration file. Um, okay, all of these tools are available through uh, our, our web pages, you can download them, but there is also, since two and a half years, uh, a repository which is developed by our, our Linux uh, engineering team, which is at that URL, which allows you to install packages using your package manager on your distribution. So you can just do apt-get install hpssa CLI and you get the component with all the dependencies and you can start working on it. Again, not open source, but available for you and, and to help you uh, manage your systems. Uh, that's what I just said. You have graphical version, web-based version, if you want to update the firmware, blah, 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 blah. Uh, other, other way to interact with the hardware platform, IPMI, which has been there for a very long time, which is pretty 
uh, rudimentary as a, as a system, as a tool uh, to help you do uh, system management. So mostly what you can do is interact with the power management of your system and, and get the power status, um, set the system off or on, and mostly that's what you will be able to do uh, using IPMI. So pretty poor, but uh, that's typically what is used in components such as uh, Ironic uh, from the OpenStack project to interact with the servers that don't need much more than that possibility to stop and start a server and make it boot on, on whatever you, you want. Um, so much more interesting, in my opinion, is what we have developed recently. So this tool, currently HP REST is available to do, um, again, it's not an open source tool yet, despite the fact it's written in Python, so I, I don't know. In fact, I don't know. I, I have not read the license of this one. So maybe, maybe this one is open, so I'm not sure. Um, so this is the client part, which can interact with our REST API on the ILO, and allows you to pass through a startup <coughs> called Redfish all the information, inventory information from your server, and also take action and modify the way the server is configured. Again, through uh, out-of-band uh, mode using an HTTPS connection, so it's, uh, you, you benefit from all the features of a REST API, it can be secured very easily. Um, and it supports, so it allows you to, to do configuration of BIOS and ILO settings in the, in the first version that we have, and you need to have a recent system with a recent ILO version to be able to use it. Um, I think that by the end of this month, by the end of October, the version 2.30 of the BIOS will allow you to support the official Redfish 1.0. So Redfish is standardized by the DMTF. I don't remember if I have a slide on that. Yeah, it's standardized by the DMTF. Um, and they have published during uh, this summer the, the first 1.0 version. So Redfish is, is sponsored, it's supported originally by HP, Intel, Emerson, Dell. So different companies representing a certain number of servers. And hopefully everybody will, will jump on, on, on it because it's really uh, helpful to, to use, especially in, in that world of big data, of cloud environments where everything is going through REST API today. So you have all the mechanism available. So it's really interesting to be able to do the same for hardware management instead of just doing it for software management. Uh, and so you will get, so this is uh, fully described in the standard, you will get all the information that you can and you can modify some of those uh, using the REST API, uh, doing past operation on, on the, through the REST API on, on your system. Um, Last feature we are providing on product systems, uh, you have now the possibility to manage firmware using packages, which was not the case up to uh, very recently. We introduced that this year. So I showed you previously there is a graphical interface to do firmware um, management. That's nice, but that's not really uh, easy for an enterprise customers who want to deploy a large set of systems. So having the possibility to use packages for firmware is pretty interesting because it allows you to benefit from all the features of a package. So it's signed, it has checksums, it has dependency management, you can put it in your uh, repository and, and get all the dependencies installed uh, automatically. And then you have the HP SUM tool which can list the firmware available and upgrade the firmware from the command line. So now we have a, really a, an easy way to, and a more Linux uh, friendly way to deploy the firmware on the systems. So let's talk about some specific platforms. I don't want to sell to you anything. You, you, you're free to not buy anything. Just to give you an idea of why we need interactions with the Linux community. Um, Everybody is buying two socket servers. That's easy. Uh, it's available from uh, every vendor. Uh, but some of the, our customers want to have high, what we call high-end systems. So, uh, this system typically is made of blades, which can have two Intel E7 CPUs, a uh, certain number of DIMMs, as you can see, uh, an ILO board also, controller, network connectivity, etc. So if you go back to uh, the previous slide, um, here inside the box, you can get 
up to eight of such blades with an interconnect in the middle, which is a specific interconnect uh, developed especially for this machine because we can do a hardware isolation. So we can group, for example, two cell and say, this is a server. Here we can group the four following, this is a server. And the two here, this is another server. And we may allow people to run different operating systems, different uh, software environment on those different servers. That's the purpose of, of such a system. So when we go uh, further, if you look at the characteristic of the, of the machine, uh, this is something which can go up to 384 DIMS, which means 12 terabytes currently of RAM inside the box, uh, up to 480 threads per system. So that's not the typical system. And we had those systems available in the labs. We gave remote access to our partners developing distributions so that they can log on the system and check that the distribution has everything inside the, their kernel to support those systems. Uh, and that's why here you need at least RHEL 66, RHEL 70 plus, and SLES 11 SP3 to be able to install those systems because before you don't have the right drivers. What we have done also on this system is that Intel is providing some RAS features and the box itself is providing some RAS features. So uh, features allowing you to have more availability and reliability of the system. So typically when you have PCI errors, when you have uh, memory errors, when you have um, a certain number of hardware errors occurring on the system, we have developed or adapt most of the time, drivers to take into account those hardware errors and recover from the errors instead of crashing stupidly. So the goal is really that the system is more available and more resilient to er hardware errors coming because when you put 300 DIMMs in a machine, what is the probability that one of those DIMMs fail? Much higher than when you have four DIMMs in, in a server. So the more hardware components you have in a system like that, the more the software needs to help you not crash your system when you have a hardware issue because probability of having hardware issues increase a lot. So that's typically what we have done. We have, we have made a certain number of contributions. So when we say kernel contributions, that's interesting from our perspective because we, we consider we do kernel contributions, but sometimes you never see hp.com addresses uh, in the kernel logs because we generally pass through our partners. So Susie, Red Hat, and we push those patches to them, and they are patching the upstream kernels themselves. So most of the time, those modifications, you don't see them coming from HP, despite the fact that those are HP engineers working behind the scenes on it. That's probably one drawback we have. We don't necessarily know very well how to work with the Linux community, or well enough to do it directly. We prefer to go through some channels, uh, of, of this, especially the distribution vendors, uh, to make our modification uh, arriving in the standard and upstream kernel. So I consider that as a drawback, uh, but that's the way we are, we are working at the moment. Another type of system which requires um, Linux enablement on our side uh, is the Moonshot chassis. <laughs> so um, so uh, th this is a standard chassis for use, uh, length of a, of a rack, but in it you can put 45 cartridges. And those cartridges could be uh, an Atom-based server, a Xeon-based server, or an ARM-based server. You have switches inside the box, and so you can and you can have some dedicated uh, cartridges to do tr video transcoding uh, with some uh, some specific processors on top of them. So. Again, those boxes are a bit special and targeting some specific workloads and needs adaptation at the, at the uh, <coughs> Linux, Linux environment to support the DSP, for example, that Texas is providing on those cartridges or to support the, uh, uh, some of the Intel drivers, uh, chipsets that we are using inside those cartridges um, to support the switch and the, the global uh, hardware infrastructure because this box has many ILOs um, gathered together into a single management interface to make it possible, but one ILO cannot pilot 45 uh, cartridges like that. So that's a new, a new type of environment, and, and ARM cartridges, uh, typically in that, uh, in that context, uh, also require uh, 
a Linux version which is uh, working on ARM, and the only one currently we have is Canonical. We're working with Red Hat to have uh, Rel 7.2 available on, on those uh, systems as well in the, in the near future. But there is a lot of work to enable those systems. Typically, Red Hat does not want, for example, to support our cartridges when they use on ARM, when they don't use UEFI. So we had to put UEFI on top of the cartridges to be able to have Red running on, on the system. So a lot of interactions between the different actors to make those systems work and <coughs> customers able to, de to deploy workloads on, on top of it. Um, and, and a bit of science fiction. So we announced something that we call the machine. Uh, which is not really a system, but an idea of what a system could be in, in the future. Future could be five years from now. Um, the idea is to say, okay, for really big data analysis, we would need uh, a re-architecture of what we know as a server today. Um, idea is to say we want to have pool of processors, pool of memory, and very, very quick interconnect between all those components, so that we can make a very large system using photonics for communication. Um, again, multi-core systems and memory store or something similar to, to memory store as a storage system. And you see there is no real disk in that design that's on purpose because those memory stores are so large in terms of capacity and performance that you don't need hard drives anymore. So that's the type of, uh, so, so we are working with the Linux community to see how the system can be adapted to take advantage of that. Uh, if you don't have a hard disk, do you really need to have an FSCK command and, and all those mechanisms inside your file system to, <coughs> so you need checks, you need coherency, of course, of, uh, of your data, but maybe it will be done differently because you're just dealing with RAM and not uh, hard drives anymore. So this is persistent memory when you shut down the system, everything stays in place when you turn on the system again, everything is back. So it's a completely different approach compared to what we have as, uh, as environment up to now. And, and there will, we will have a, a big need to adapt uh, how Linux is working with memory, with file systems, to be able to support that and also, of course, the, uh, the photonics communication in the middle. So, that's, a, that's something which is currently developed in our labs. Uh, there should be next year some experiments around it on, on physical components. Right now it's just simulated. Um, and some of those technologies we find, we find their way in next version of our standard servers. So we will see those stuff uh, arriving uh, progressively in, in the physical servers. Um, one of the aspects is the NVMe, so non-volatile memory uh, that you will have very soon on, on most of the providers. Again, that's a, a large change in the way you are dealing with storage on your servers because uh, for NVMe, this is uh, non-volatile memory. So this is memory, this is not a disk, but it's seen as a disk uh, and it's used as a disk today. So a lot of adaptation to think about how we will deal with operating system in the future on, on those. And, the lab is working in parallel on some, uh, what I would say, uh, operating system from scratch uh, to, to try to design something which would completely take advantage of, of that design and just run on that design. And we need to see how we can collaborate with the Linux community to exchange on some of the technology to provide those technology to, to the kernel community. Um, Something we have also in our systems today and which require a lot of collaboration with the uh, Linux ecosystem. So kernel and distribution vendors uh, for low-level tools is UEFI. So for us, UEFI is replacing completely the BIOS of our servers. Uh, this is again a standard, uh, followed by uh, 250 members uh, at the industry, um, which has reached version 2.5, again, pretty recently. Not all the firmware of all the vendors are following that version, but there are very interesting features in that 2.5 version. Um, typically, one I want to underline is the possibility, for example, to boot from HTTP instead of booting through PXC. So you will be able to boot your server and to say, OK, the image is here on the net. Just boot from it. And I know it, it, we had ways to do that years ago using some specific tools. Uh, 
but here it will be, uh, it's part of the standard. So it's, it's, it's a need which has been recognized by the people developing viruses to say, okay, we need to provide that feature, make it easy to go through firewalls and whatever, have access to our, our image from, uh, from HTTP or from FTP, by the way, for the same stuff. Um, Another, for me, another controversial but interesting feature is Secure Boot. Um, so there has been a lot of discussion about Secure Boot, especially in the past. I think today uh, stuff are much cleaner and the people also part of the uh, UEFI forum understood better the, the problems that the Linux community had with Secure Boot and has taken actions to make it uh, usable by the Linux community and useful for the Linux community as well. So the goal of Secure Boot is to allow you to only boot trusted software. But trusted software that you can either make by using keys from the guy you trust or using your own keys because you just trust yourself. So in Secure Boot today you have the possibility to either use the Microsoft keys, that's why for example the Red Hat guy do, they use their bootloader, which is uh, Grub. They, they, they use a shim bootloader between, before Grub. The shim bootloader is a very, very small piece of code, which is signed by Microsoft, uh, because they can look at the code and, and check it's very small, check it does not do anything strange. Uh, the guy from Red Hat takes that shim bootloader signed by Microsoft, and they sign themselves with their keys, their grub bootloader. So the chain of trust is, is put in place, and then the signs are kernels, the signs are modules, and so you can have a full boot chain from the firmware up to the kernel modules, completely signed by different uh, actors, ISVs, vendors, that you trust. Or is that you don't trust, but at least uh, so you know who signed what and who provides what to, to, to you. Um, why Microsoft is signing the shim bootloader? Because Microsoft is the only company who put enough money on the table to say, I want to be managing certificates for the UEFI environment. They had to do it for Windows and say, okay, if we have done it for Windows, we can do it as well for the Linux community. And so they provide that service and the shim bootloader was invented to not force uh, people to sign, to make their kernel signed by uh, Microsoft, which would have been a nightmare because each time you have a security update, you would have need to go back to Microsoft and say, hey, please, we had a security update, resign my kernel. So that was not, or resign my bootloader. That was not a possibility. So the shim bootloader is supposed to not be changing, to be very, very stable piece of code. It's signed, one, it's signed once, and if the bootloader changes, the kernel changes, there is no problem. The distribution vendor completely controls the keys they are using to sign those piece of software. And again, um, if you're using Secure Boot, you can rip all the keys which are in the hardware and you can put only your keys in the hardware and do whatever you want. So if you are working for the NSA or working for the secret services in any country, uh, you can sign everything from the hardware up to the software that you are launching on your system and that will work and secure. So the, the secure aspect is that each step verifies that the previous step <coughs> contains a key which have signed the next step that you're booting. And if that's not the case, it stops booting. So if, you're, if one of your modules has, has been changed by someone, it won't be signed correctly, so it won't load as part of your kernel uh, load mechanism. So that's the principle of, uh, of the secure boot feature. Uh, we talked a bit about the RESTful API already. Um, so this is provided by our UEFI BIOS and access through the ILO. Uh, so the ILO is running a, a RESTful API service and you have access to all the settings available inside your box and you can get through the um, REST interface uh, the configuration information and you have the possibility to put changes on the system through, through that uh, verb uh, of, the, of the interface and some of the components and more and more will be uh, modifiable by, by, uh, by users of the, of the interface in the future. So again, this is an emerging standard. That's something I, I really believe will make life much easier for people uh, involved in large development of, uh, of servers such as cloud or big data. 
Um, let me jump to... Okay, so I, I talk a bit about our relationship to, um, to how we push patches in the, in the Linux kernel. Um, so the way, the way we do it internally, we have an internal mailing list which looks like the kernel mailing list, but much more friendly, of course because everybody's working for HP, so there is no reason <laughs> people yield at each other. You are friendly. Uh, so the idea is that each time people are working on some patches, they are pushing those patches to our internal mailing list for a first review. Um, people are reviewing it using the same tool as, uh, as the Linux community, by the way. And, uh, and once, once it's ready, generally it's pushed uh, either to um, Lieutenant of, of Linux or of Craig, um, or through the distribution vendors, which is on the next slide. So generally, that's what we do. We, we, we make modification, we push them to Red Hat or to SLES, and they push that to the upstream uh, version of the, of the kernel um, because they have a better structure than us to, to, to do that. Uh, so how does it look like when you are looking at, uh, so, so it was mentioned this morning during Craig's presentation, so he, he made a patch for 314 this morning in front of you. So this is based off uh, RHEL 66, uh, RHEL, RHEL, uh, yeah, through RHEL 66, a certain number of patches float here. So the original RHEL, if you go back to 6GA, the kernel originally was 2636. So each time the guy from Red Hat, so I take Red Hat as an example, <laughs> we do the same exercise with the Debian Ubuntu or OpenCV Slash. Uh, they, they, they first go through their respective open source distribution, so Fedora for the Red Hat guy, and, and they take a version of, of kernel and they say, okay, uh, for uh, our Fedora 14, we will standardize on 2636. And we will use that component <laughs> in Fedora 14. And that's also Fedora 14, which was used as base for Red 6. And so when they are supporting, so you, you, you have seen there is a long time support activity on the kernel upstream, but those guys are doing a very long time support of each of their components uh, because they support uh, their components for 10 plus three years potentially. So it's pretty long. And they need also to backport a certain number of features from more recent kernels as much as they can into uh, the, the next version of what they release to customers. So uh, they may take some stuff of 314 and put it in on, on Red 6. It's of course, as it's a base of 26, it needs some adaptation as you were explaining this morning. You pass your time rewriting patches because uh, of course they do not apply uh, cleanly. Um, and each distribution has, has this type of way of working, which makes you see that if major distribution standardize on a single kernel uh, to make the, their version, uh, they can share much more work around a long time support of a specific version of a kernel, which could be, which could be interesting. Um, <coughs> so what, they, what, we, what is done at, at the Linux kernel level is done in a similar way for all the rest, all the other components of a Linux distribution. And typically, when we were uh, working on the uh, on the RAS uh, Linux patches to support our uh, 400 uh, threads and uh, 12 terabytes of RAM, etc., uh, that that was of course done at the Linux kernel level, but not only. We wanted to have the KVM layer also working correctly on top of that. We wanted to have some error management uh, available through. Uh, log management of, of the system, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there are a lot of interaction between the different components, not just at the, at the kernel level, even if it's uh, the main cause of, uh, of the work which has been done here. <coughs> okay. Another point we, as a hardware vendor, needs to take in account is alignment of roadmaps of the different <laughs> actors. And the whole industry, in fact, is relying on Intel today. So Intel is giving a cadence which is called the TikTok model, uh, every uh, 18 months, uh, they tend to publish, so 12, 18 months, depending on, 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 the, on the version, uh, they publish a new version of their processor, and one time they publish the same set of instructions set, but in a reduced 
uh, form factor, and the next time they publish a new version of the instruction set, but in the same form factor, in the same uh, uh, um, size of, uh, of burning the, the CPU itself. So currently we are, in fact, here. Um, for the servers, Broadwell is not yet part of the, of the server line. Uh, it will arrive uh, next year. So we have a bit of delay here. Um, and so we have to build our server's line based on those evolution of CPUs. But of course, when we publish a server, when it's okay, Gen 9 was uh, when in September 2014. We need to look at what is available in terms of operating system at that time and to say what do we, what will, will we support? And the policy is to support current version of enterprise version uh, of Linux and N minus one. So when we said we will issue Gen 9, we will have to support, so again, this is a red example, we do the same exercise with the other. Um, we have to support RHEL 7 because RHEL 7 was already published. And we, so we also have to support RHEL 6, but not RHEL 5. So RHEL 5 is not available on Gen 9, and it corresponds to the fact that Red Hat, anyway, uh, does not really support to add hardware, new hardware features as part of their uh, <coughs> kernel uh, so late in the history of, of RHEL 5. So we could do it on RHEL 6, we could do it on RHEL server. But when we issue the server, so when it's available for public consumption in September 2014, it was started in 2012 in terms of research and design. So in 2012, we need to discuss with all the hardware uh, uh, manufacturer, uh, independent manufacturer, OEMs for us, uh, that will provide the various components, the NIC drivers, the uh, HVA drivers, uh, drivers and, and the hardware components, of course, uh, chipsets, etc. And we need to, be, to work with those guys to say, okay, what will you provide to us in terms of hardware components? And then we go back to Red Hat, Les, uh, Suzy, and, and Canonical. Say, okay, in the kernel, we will need to have that type of driver available at the time. That's why you see sometimes in, in some kernels that uh, Intel is, is pushing some drivers for a hardware which does not exist. But because it takes time before, when you submit something to Red Hat, for example, it takes a couple of months to be accepted by them and then to go into uh, the roadmap and then to go finally in the rel.6. something version. It can take months, smallish year. So uh, we, you, you really need to work in advance and the software needs to be there really in advance so that when the products are really available, you have the right support in your environment. And it arrives sometimes that there are mismatch alignment between some manufacturer and some uh, software vendor and that you need to wait the next dot something version of rel or sp something version of less to really have the hardware support that you need for, for your platform. So that's the type of problems our uh, R&D teams are, are trying to solve. And then you have the QA because of course you get the software, you, so we get access to alpha version, beta version of, of those uh, enterprise version and the guy, the QA team pass a lot of time testing those versions to be sure that it will work correctly on our platform. So all that takes a bit of time, and that's why you may sometimes see some differences in, uh, in the availability and, uh, and what we do. And that's the end, so let me... Okay, and that's the end. So, any question? Yeah. So, I, uh, you mentioned to a number of uh, remote access technologies and in the firmware itself, and it's also uh, in the tools community, the tools and the ones running the firmware The question is uh, how, how much trust you can put in HP. That's what we deliver is really what we pretend to deliver no, somewhere. Not quite, not that, that I, I'm, that I'm paraphrasing. So, 
So, so in, in IT, there is, at one moment in time, you need to trust something. Uh, and that's difficult to accept, but that's something you really need to do. Because if you don't trust um, something, you should start getting sand and building your own processes. Because you don't know what Intel has put in microcodes inside your processor. You don't know what we put inside our ILO controller. You don't know what um, uh, Broadcom puts in the firmware of the network cards. Nobody knows. Well, some people know, but very few. And, and nobody has a full knowledge of all those components all together. And that's not possible in the way the industry is currently working. Not to say that it would not be desirable that we are more open, but that's not what we are at the point now. Okay, so, for example, so,
from this, how, so how do you determine, what, why are we creating those tiny systems or those uh, water benchmarks, which is those gas rescues, et cetera? It's to find new ways to, for us to do requirements from our customers. And of course, we, we want to make money out of it because uh, we want to pay our, uh, I want to pay the general market, actually, to be honest. So, uh, to earn my salary, we need to find ways to differentiate ourselves, to, 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 to propose to customers better solutions, better to be seen as not as good enough as we may think, because we have to open source all the code around it. But uh, we need to find ways to, to differentiate and, and, and provide also the value for our customers. That's the way the IT industry is working today. That's probably not the way it will be in 20 years from now. But that will be a requirement by many people. Some issues with the communication you mentioned. Uh, I don't mean with the, uh, with the hardware, it's when it comes to the software, mm -hmm. and mostly with the tools that are provided. So you're doing uh, things for the main business, mm -hmm. providing the tools and the main content. And recently, uh, I think since the neighboring development has been stopped short, and we have uh, having some. Solution like this, and uh, it will be uh, HP 1D. Uh, we have also an NFC. It's really popular. It's early. No, it's, it's really popular. It's actually really popular. Uh, yeah. So it's, so it's uh, really uh, not bringing uh, the, the problem of the because it's uh, working uh, great for us. So that's a great use kind of the revenue, and we are having. Okay. Thank you.